Hello, um, my name is Jahan Ujain, and this is Kareem Amr, my partner. Um, we, uh, we're here from Egypt, um, and we, uh, we made the film, uh, I've been making films in the Middle East for a long time, um, starting from Control Room, which was about the Iraq War, um, to the square where we met. Um, and uh, uh, I have to say, I'm so excited, so honored to be leading this discussion on, on the film today because we've seen many films um, from our part of the world. And a lot of times it feels like it's really somebody outside looking in. And with this film, there was an intimacy to it that really made you feel like you understood, you were with the characters, you understood who they were. Um, little moments that just, where, where you saw a doctor who was um, asking a little patient, the little patient to, to smile in the same way that you would have that detail and understand that detail in the US. I, I can't imagine a more important film to be to be um, presenting to you. It's um, it's it's truly a masterpiece, and so um, thank you, Sky, for for having me here today. And uh, and and yeah, Kareem. it's um, it's really an honor to be here, and we're we love Sky's work, and he once again has um, you know has has managed to really be able to take the the difficult stories that are oftentimes uh, almost too um, painful for us to look at uh, because of the immense human drama that they that they force us to understand and bear witness to. But Sky's brilliance is that he's able to force you as an audience member to to feel a connection with these stories and with these people by humanizing them and by bringing them to life in, uh, in a master way through his verite filmmaking. Oh boy, I'm <laughs> thank you for those kind words. I am just so honored to be in both of your presence. Uh, it was great to talk with you briefly the other day. And uh, I, I know I mentioned this um, the other time we chatted briefly, but you both have been such an inspiration to me that it feels uh, especially special <laughs> just for us to have a moment to talk about my own work um, when I've been influenced inspired by yours. So uh, thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy lives to, to spend a moment. Well, thank you, Sky. The first time when we saw the film and talked with Sky, uh, just to share with you, I just said, thank you. you know, thank you for making it because um, this is a war that is very important for people to understand um, and to really you know, get much closer to what's happening there. And not only to understand in the US, it is very crucial for it to be understood in the US, but in our part of the world as well. And I will tell you that it was amazing to have the Oscar nomination for The Square in terms of spreading the word about it in the US, but what the Oscar nomination did for the square worldwide, and especially in our part of the world, was to put it on the map as a serious film that needed to be paid attention to. And that was so crucial for us and for the film and for it getting out there. And this film needs that same kind of support. We know that this, there's a conversation about what's happening in Yemen, but 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 people people that we know in our circles who who people who uh, we see every day they don't see and relate to what's happening there um, by a, a show on Al Jazeera or something like that. You really have to see a film like this, see this film to get close to the characters um, and to experience it in this masterful verite way that Sky um, has done to 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 feel close to people and to really understand what's happening there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it, it's easy to be inured by the numbers, right? By statistics, by X number of, you know, children are starving in fill in the blank country. Um, but I think that's part of the problem, right? Is that we hear these statistics, um, but, but it's different to hear a statistic than to see it and feel it and immerse yourself in it. And, and I think, you know, um, 
that's one of the things that that moved me so much about the square actually was i feel like your film you know it was on the front lines of a revolution right literally in the streets right you're in in the middle of this vibrant effort to change a culture right and the governing culture of an entire country and culture and and um it's powerful because of that right because you're in the middle of it and i feel like what i tried to do with hunger ward is sort of the same thing but in a different way right hunger ward is sort of one of the ways i tried to see it was you know it's the quiet aftermath of the revolution right of a revolution that was only partially politically successful right even though it was part of the same movement that you covered so brilliantly in the square um it you know in yemen it took a different turn didn't it and uh, a different government coming did come into play and then there was you know um you know ansar allah did come down from the north and take over much of the country which is uh, a revolution in itself right people don't frame it that way but it really was um and and yet now what we're seeing is the impact of that right years later how does that impact your average yemeni and i think that's something that's really easy to overlook right is war has impacts right not just on the front lines but it impacts your common person far more greatly than it does a soldier with a rifle Absolutely. And can you talk to us about how what brought you to the topic and how did you meet the people that you that you filmed so intimately? They they obviously had a trust with you to allow you to just be there with the camera and and observe. Um it, it, please please I would love to know more about about what brought you there and to the people. It was um I guess the 30,000 foot view on that is that it was a really long a really long process years in the making ultimately because um it is the the third film of this trilogy that I've been working on and the the you know the entire foundational principle or catalyst for the trilogy was this knowledge that you know about 1% of the world's population I think it's a, or in the 80 million range is is currently displaced homeless right uh not able to live in their home and to me that started with the first film of the trilogy focusing on sort of the the large exodus from Syria when the, when the conflict was um early in the making in Syria and and then it moved into a study of the second ge geographical placement of of asylum seekers trying to cross the Mediterranean with lifeboat and the third was was Yemen um looking on the IDP population the internally displaced people because that's a huge demographic that we don't really think about very much it's those people displaced within their own borders because of conflict and war um so so that sort of funneled down to to Yemen as the third geographical placement and it came out of colleagues it came out of talking to a lot of colleagues who um had worked in Yemen um who eventually led me to both Makia Maji as well as um Dr. Al Sadiq in in Sadaka Hospital and the more I learned about their incredibly just selfless work right doing the hard difficult work of treating children dying of starvation um from a human caused famine I felt like it was the kind of story that we should be paying attention to the kind of human effort to change sing single lives that that we don't see often enough right um and so i i started building relationships with them from afar um and then eventually you know found a way to get into both the north and south of the country and and basically embed in both of their clinics um and what um what do you hope having um now made these kind of three films um this kind of trilogy what do you, what do you what have you learned you know uh sky about the the kind of suffering going on um amongst people um and, and what do you hope audiences kind of get from this who asked the hard one kareem <laughs> i mean what what uh what do we, any of us learn from from making a film right it's it's sort of a it's a, such an interesting question um 
I, I know my hope um, throughout this film and the films that preceded it has always been to, to use the medium, to use cinema as like an empathy machine, right? To, to, to figure out how, how to focus my, you know, my, my small little effort um, in a way to really showcase people who I think we ought to see and whose work we ought to see, but, but using cinematic language, right? Using the language of cinema, of images to show and not tell, right? So that people can feel it here. Because I feel like we work in one of those mediums, cinema, that if we use the, the language of cinema in images, right, we can really bring people to a place where they, they understand a story from the heart, first and foremost. And so that, that was my goal. Um, whether I've succeeded or not, who knows, but that it's an empathy, empathy machine, I guess, is my, is my, is my first answer. You succeeded. the the okay. faces uh, the faces and and some of the words of the people in your film have stuck with me uh, since seeing it. That they're 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 very much burned in, in my my heart and my mind. So, really, congratulations on that. And I think that that's a really you know um, important answer you know to understand because it it goes back to your form right, which I think is important to. To discuss in, 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 in this kind of conversation, which is that many people, um, you know, there's all kinds of documentary filmmaking and we love all of them. Um, but I think that when it comes to bringing the invisible uh, stories that are often on the fringes of our minds to the forefront, I, I, I would argue that it is this verite format that is the best way to do so because it is in that format that you can really um, feel like you're in someone else's shoes, feel like you've really lived through, you know, you're in, you take us into that hunger ward, you take us into this hospital. We feel like we are with that doctor. We understand a glimpse of what it's like to be them. And if you can allow for people, you know, in the United States and other parts of the world to be in the shoes of a Yemeni doctor, um, and, and, to, and to see the heroism in her daily life, that's a massive accomplishment. And that's a, that's a choice that you're choosing to create with your craft. And I think that that's what inspires us all because it gives us hope that, you know, we, we, we're, not, we're not the doctor, you know, we're not saving lives and we're not, our films don't change the world, but what our films hopefully can do is give you a glimpse of what it's like to be in the shoes of some of those who, who are doing that work and who, we can't, we need to get more attention to them. Um, and whether that makes you care more about Yemen or just care more about humanity or take any step in any direction, that's all that a film really is supposed to do. You know, there's no like watch this film and sign the petition and then you've saved Yemen. Like that's not really how it works, right? Uh, we wish it could be that easy. <laughs> like, well, it also but, transports us. I mean, what your film did just cinematically, it was incredible. Yeah. Just the opening shot landing from your overhead shot and onto the fan um, of that hospital, just the, the details, the mopping of the floor. I feel like I've been there. I feel like I've, I've been no, in that room. You're, so much thought went into that. Can you, could you talk about the challenges of filming um, in a highly armed society? I mean, I know that at every turn when we were filming the square, we could have had our footage. We did have our footage and our cameras confiscated. We were jailed. It's it, it. You have to be watching your back at, at every moment. And could could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. It um, it was a challenge every day, right? Um, I mean, I mean, you know, this. It's a, it's a Yemen is a highly armed society because it's it's a conflict zone right now, and um, and so I felt a deep responsibility to ensure the safety of our collaborators, you know, the doctors, the nurses, the families who chose to collaborate with us while we were there, as well as my, my very small crew. And so every decision I made was um, built on this foundation of, of how, do we, how do we capture this, these narratives in a way that, um, that doesn't that where we can mitigate risk, right? Where we can still be there and capture it 
with what feels like real intimacy, but doesn't put anyone unduly at risk. And so one of our, one of our primary mitigating factors to do that sort of played into my vision for the film anyway, which is, you know, it's what I said at the beginning about, um, about we can easily become overwhelmed by statistics, right? And to me, the power is in singularity. The power is in the, the single story of this child and this doctor, right? And spending time with them in a room. And so knowing how dangerous it is, um, you know, on the streets of Aden and some, you know, some on, up the west coast of Yemen where we were sometimes, we made a very strategic and, and uh, sort of decision to, to work as much as possible on singular stories within these two highly respected clinics, one in the south and one in, in, in the Houthi North held by Ansar Allah. And that sort of played into this idea that, well, it'll both mitigate risk for everyone involved. It's not going to put our participants at risk because we're out of view of those who might um, you know, be at risk if they knew they were participating with us. And it also kept us off the streets as well. <laughs> Well, it's so heavily armed, you know, with, with uh, armed escorts and lots of weapons everywhere. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, that's all you can do, right, is build those relationships, build that intimacy, and just listen really carefully every day, right, to, to a very dynamic environment where, you know, you might not have electricity for two days, right? So, how do you transfer your footage? Well, then you pivot into something else for a day or two because you still have camera batteries. So it was fraught with all those logistical things that happened in a conflict zone. And we just pivoted every day to what was possible rather than what we planned to do. And, uh, you know, with that um, in mind, Sky, if you could just also talk to us about like, you know, this kind of filmmaking, which, which, which Jahan and I know well, which we love and that you do, which is a kind of, it's you know this kind of very small team um, in, involved in almost all decisions together, where you kind of live, uh, you know, live the project and really do it in a kind of um, natural way, as opposed to what we're seeing now uh, in the documentary space, as things are getting more corporatized with much bigger productions and lots of pre-planning and people and all these people on on on, on the issue like. Do you feel that your um, your style of work can can exist in, in, in uh, with large formats and crews, or or do you need to keep it nimble in order to actually make these kind of filmmaking successful? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I you know I have to believe it is possible. I have to believe that there's always going to be a space for um, a filmmaker with a camera end of sentence, right? Go out into the world, wherever it is and say, this is a story that we ought to be trying to understand more fully. This is a story, this, this Yemeni doctor who is saving dozens of children a month, literally saving their lives. There's always gonna be a space for that story. And I think there has to be. And I think we, it's, it's upon us to create that space, right? We, we cannot allow the corporatization of nonfiction which is going to continue, right? To stop um, this kind of story also from coexisting, right? I think, and I think there is a way for them to coexist, but we have to, that's up to us to make sure there's that space. I mean, for me, it's just been an act of will, frankly. I mean, the first, the first two films of this trilogy, I just literally paid for on a credit card and went and shot them because people were dying, people were drowning in the Mediterranean, and that wasn't going to wait for you to submit a grant application, right? The fact that, that children are dying in Sadaka Hospital right now today isn't going to wait for a grant application. Um, so I was fortunate to have funders on this who covered hard costs for the film on this project, and I'll be forever grateful um, to Vulcan and Riot for that. But, but I would have done this film anyway as well, because I think we have to. We have to do these films, because even if they're difficult, right? Even if, even if people say no, 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 we're not going to give you money. We're not going to get. We have to do them because this is how we create change. This is how we marshal attention and resources to the things we really should be listening to. And I think it's, it's I think it's you know particularly important when um, not only is this a story that's not getting a lot of our attention as it should be. But it's also, some would argue, uh, Sky, as we talked the other day, you know, 
it, it, this is a place where U.S. taxpayer money is actually kind of complicit in a lot of this 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 war. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? I know your film, you know, focuses on characters and 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 allows us to breathe through them rather than being buried in the politics. But it is obviously a highly political work. Yeah, and but sort of obliquely so, right? You know, by by the end, right? And 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 that was that was strategic on our part as well because once again that effort to go to the heart first and then intellectualize it, I think is, a, for me, it's a more useful approach, right? Um, yeah, so, so I think to, you know, the, the moment in the film that, that I tried to express some of that most directly, if you remember, there's a scene midway through where we, we cover the aftermath of a missile strike in Sana. And as part of that, you know, um, this is a missile strike that happened in October 2016. And we interview a singer who um, was there at the memorial service. There were hundreds and hundreds of people there. And this missile strike was led by the Saudi coalition, right? So it was Saudi jets, um, probably directed by American military advisors. And it was a memorial service, right? Um, there were an estimated 140 people killed, many of them women and children from that. And it was, it was a triple tap, right? So they struck it once, right? And then people tried to escape, people came in to help, they struck it again. They struck it three times with guided missiles, right? And at least half of those who were killed were women and children. And, you know, that's not, that's not collateral damage, that's murder. And when afterwards they went in and they started to sort of do some of the journalistic investigation of, you know, how this happened and when it ha why it happened, they found, you know, sh shrapnel from the missiles. And of course, those missiles were made by an American company, Raytheon, right? So there are, um, there are, you know, war crimes happening in Yemen right now as we have this conversation. Not on the same scale as that particular strike, but those war crimes are currently supported by the American government through operational support of military strikes by the Saudi-led coalition. There are still missiles and bombs being sold to Saudi Arabia and the UAE for those strikes, right? And we have continued to be complicit in that effort that has killed primarily civilians for over five years now. And so for me as, as an American citizen, uh, as, as um, a lay person, but someone who has studied this now and spent time with the survivors of, of that missile strike and others, um, I, I feel a responsibility because we are complicit in this conflict and we are complicit in the current starvation of children in Yemen because of the air and sea blockade. And so, you know, that, that's what I wake up with every morning, like um, how important it is for us to end that uh, and to end it as quickly as possible. And so that's why we've partnered with a bunch of um, civil society groups here in the US to really put pressure on the Biden administration to end all operational support um, to uh, the Saudi led coalition immediately. Wow. That's amazing. And you have a website as well, right? For people to go to that can, that, who can follow what's, what's, what's going yeah. on. Yeah, it's just, it's hungerward.org. And we've partnered with the Friends Committee for National Legislation out of DC. And so um, you can click on, and there's a, um, I think they're putting it in the chat, but there's a get involved link. And then from there, you can directly um, communicate with your senators and your US representatives to urge them to pressure the Biden administration to, to end US involvement in war. So there's that. And then we also have worked out a system where um, interested parties can donate directly to the two clinics that we work with um, in the film, um, which is, was, was uh, we thought that would be a, a really vital way for people to contribute directly to Al Sadiq's and Makia's work uh, if they can. So those are two sort of immediate tools that anyone can engage with. That's amazing. And that's on the website and the, yeah, yeah great. Um, 
Yeah. yeah, you know, yesterday was the 10th anniversary of, of, of uh, the event at Tahrir Square, you know, January 25th, and um, it's a very complicated day for many of us because um, it's not really celebrated in, in, in the media here in Egypt at all. Um, and, you know, but it was a moment to kind of reflect and think about, you know, some people have called it the lost decade, seems pretty um, sad to think of it that way. Others are saying we're still in the beginning of understanding what it means. But I think when we look at the, the, the battle cry of that revolution, it was Aish Horreya Adelektimaya, you know, bread, uh, freedom, and social justice. And, and, and I think that that was the main battle cry in Yemen, in Egypt, and in so many other parts of the world. And in many ways, what the Arab world went through during those years, we've now seen the collapse of inequality happening around the world. Um, and I think we should, you know, we, we have a responsibility as your film shows us to realize that these, um, what's happening, you know, the unrest that's happened there and how people have been left alone um, isn't so foreign, you know, to anymore. It's not just something, the conflict zones aren't just happening in places over there. They're happening everywhere. So I, I hope this can kind of, bring us closer somehow during these um, very uncertain times, Sky. Yeah, 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 I think, um, I, I think you're right. I think, um, you know, this is, this is a moment, to me, I, I, you know, the last number of years has been so unsettling on, on so many different levels, right? I mean, not just in the US, but globally throughout the Middle East. And, um, you know, I, I'm just a big believer in the power of the individual, right? Like, I think it's so easy to succumb to, you know, how do you solve world hunger, <laughs> right? Those sorts of questions, because if you tackle it in that way, you'll be crushed, right? You know, it's like, no one can expect you or me or anyone else to solve world hunger. But you know what we can do is each of us can take the tools that each of us have, right? Whether that's resources or a camera or a law degree, or a large bank account, whatever your resource is, and you can apply it accordingly, right? To your sphere of influence. And that's always been sort of my philosophy with these human rights films is, yeah, I'm not gonna solve world hunger, but you know what? I can champion Dr. Al-Sadiq and the fact that in, in my world, in my view, she's a hero. She's, she's a common person hero who is saving lives on a daily basis. And, and I, I wanna showcase that, right? I wanna champion her um, till the day I die. And, and she's making a difference one child at a time. And I think that's all any of us can do within our own sphere of influence. So that's the hope, that's the hope that I wake up with every day too, is that yes, there's so much strife and there's so many problems, but I do think each of us has the capability to do something, right? Within our own reach. And that gives me hope every day. Absolutely. And your film, you know, honoring these incredible women, these incredible doctors um, and, and, and what's happening in the conflict is, is, is just so important. Um, and getting it out, I think, to our circle, I'm going to do my best to get it to as many people as I can, um, because we did see what, you know, what, what this group of people um, you know, voters and people who are able to get a film like this on the sort of, you know, consciousness of people around the world. It's, it's a very, very powerful thing. Um, well, I think I, you I said recently, it in the beginning, right? It's like, this yeah. is the, you know, the worst famine of our lifetime. And, yeah. and we as a doc community have the ability to make a choice and get this front and center on a global stage. And I think that's on us, you know? And I say this also because, you know, a few couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine who writes for a local paper was trying to do something on the 10 year anniversary of the square and of, of, the, of the Egyptian revolution and the square. And so she contacted all of the characters that were in the square and wrote this whole piece and she was never able to publish it. So the reason why I say, I just got the email today saying the reason you didn't see a piece yesterday is because we were never able to get it out there. So I'm, I'm just saying, you know, personal experience, it's very difficult to get these messages out in our part of the world. And the power that we saw that our doc community had in terms of getting a film like this out there 
globally was so so important and it reminds people that they're not alone you yeah. know and that and, and that is what yeah. allows for that triumph of individual will despite the odds to continue to persevere which is the only way that change has really ever happened as we've known it and so that's why you know we're so supportive of, of your work and especially of this film at this time because this has been an abandoned story by the world, um, by so many of us, and we have to all do our part. And if giving your vote is is what we can do in this, then it's something we should do. And and that's it. I mean, I don't know what film is more urgent. Sorry, than any than this film. I hate to say it, but it's the most urgent in my view. It's very, it's very kind of you. It's very kind of you. I want, I want to, I want to just mention one thing because it goes back to this idea of hope. Um, and sort of the triumph of will that you both mentioned. And it's, um, maybe this will resonate with you as well, but, you know, I think it's easy to look at a conflict like what's happening in Yemen, right? And feel hopeless, right? And, and, and to see um, the fact that um, a child dies literally of starvation in 2020 and think as a human being, as a parent, you know, just how, how can this be? And to feel sort of crushed by that, right? And, and it was something that, that I sort of dealt with in the, in the field, right? Because it's, it's hard to see a mother grieve the loss of her child. It's hard to see a child die from hunger in front of you. And yet I think that the saving grace was just, I have this idea that, that there, is, there is beauty wherever we look if we look for it, right? So that every moment in these clinics, I was looking for beauty, right? I was looking for the beauty of an action. I was looking for how can we compose this in a beautiful way? How can we do coverage on the scene away in a way that we truly do sort of bear witness to the moment um, with honor um, in a way so that people, even if they're tempted to look away, can't because they're kind of being hooked by the beauty of it and, mm -hmm. and, and allow people to bear witness. Cause I think it's so important to bear witness, right. To what's happening. And so that was like the central tension for us throughout, throughout the filming of it is, is how do we, how do we use the principle of beauty to frame this? Because it's there if you look for it through the actions of the doctors, through the actions of the mothers, through, through so many ways. But, but I think that that was our way to, to really cover such a difficult, set of content that we are faced with day in and day out. Absolutely. And I, I think that's why, uh, one of the big reasons why I connected so much with the film, um, because you just saw these little moments of humanity um, amidst such a difficult story, difficult to watch. You, and you, as you said, you couldn't turn your eyes away because you felt invested in the characters because you fell in love with the, the doctor and, 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 and these little moments that are very human moments that, um, that you could relate to because, anywhere in the because world. Because you fell in love with how, you, how we met them through you, Sky, And that's what's really important to us to know is that you know, this story in the hands of so many other people, I mean, we've, we've seen it. I mean, the Middle East is like, was the kind of, buccaneering place where uh, you know so many doc filmmakers to come mostly from western countries and we usually have an allergy to those films to be totally honest but the reason why we don't with this film is because sky really you see the humanity in every shot you see the way the graciousness the patience the elegance of of of, 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 of the way he's, he's structuring and, and, and looking at these people and and meeting them and not seeing them as voyeuristic things, not seeing them as kind of the more mercenary approach that sometimes you see with- Or the pitiful like, approach. Or the pitiful there was approach. no, I didn't no. see pity it's at not, all, which was wonderful. And, and, was and, wonderful. And, and, it's, and it's important to remember, this is a white man filming Yemeni women up close and to, for them to have that level of fit, trust in him says yeah. so much about the relationship there and so much about the trust which is the basis of, of this kind of documentary filming is a trust from the, from the subjects to the filmmaker. And I think it's, you know, Sky, you know, doesn't give himself enough credit for that. But that's a huge aspect of this, that he's able to have these people trust him 
you know, to, to, to open their, their intimate moments of their lives, to be there in the rooms, to bear witness, and to, to hope that in them trusting him, that he can broadcast the story to a world and that something can change. And I think that's why we bring it back to how can we get behind this film and really give it the attention it deserves um, during this award season. Yeah, it's, it's, it's about dignity, right? You know, I mean, it's, it's about always treating, I mean, that's how I see treating people with dignity. Um, and, and, and that's how trust is built, I think, right? Is, is if you treat others with dignity, you build trust over time. And I, I think if we hadn't moved through um, these wards with the doctors and the families in a really careful way over time, um, we wouldn't have the film that you see in Hunger Ward, right? And that takes time. Right, and I wanted to mirror that in the production too. It's why it's not a fast cutting film, right? It's why we have so many shots that are close to 90 seconds <laughs> without a cut, right? I mean, for American viewers, that's like, ah, what? But, but it, it is also is immersive, right? But by, by allowing a moment to unfold, you experience that person's experience differently, right? By simply watching it unfold in real time and, and, and and that was a, a very a conscious choice as well. That was based on just building trust. We didn't want to be jumping around a lot, right? We wanted to like build relationships slowly with, with people in both wards. So it was sort of part and parcel of our entire approach. So. Can we open it up to questions or what, what, what would you guys prefer at this point? Yeah, I think so. Um, let's see here. I think they can feed us some in the side here. Yeah. Okay, so this is. Um, um, no, go, go down, John. Should we read this one? Um, go down. Okay, the link. This link shows. This is from. Is this a question or should? Uh, or should I? This link shows the power of shocking images and behavior change. I thought it might have some relevance because it supports the use of film and images in changing behavior. Bravo. Um, I think we should just continue. Yeah, well, let's just continue then. Asking questions. Well, um, and anybody who has questions, please please send them in. Um, um, well, I want to ask you a question, Jahan, about, you know, um, I think having worked with Penny Baker, you know, um, as your mentor. Penny Baker? Sorry? I didn't know you worked with Penny Baker. Oh, yeah, Kristen. Oh my God, I didn't know that part of your history and bio. Wow, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. Go Chris ahead. and Penny No, no, they were, Chris Hedges and D.A. Penny Baker were very, very big mentors of mine. So I, I made my first film with them. Well, oh. lucky enough to make my first film with them. We just pass it along, don't we? No, but I think that's why I, I brought it up because I think that's why it resonates with you, Sky's style, because it's very. He would have loved this film. You know, he said, he said when he saw uh, Control Room, and I said, oh, it's you know, it's a little lopsided, and he said, no, 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 it was like my hometown of Chicago was being bombed. <laughs> and he's like, and if Jesus had a broken leg, he would still be Jesus, right? And I feel this, I feel like he would be saying the same thing to you right now because you really felt like it was your hometown. You felt like you knew these people. And that's what he was such a master and what Chris is such a master at doing is, um, is, is building these time machines really where you feel where you really can transport somebody into another time and place and 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 you know you, you this film will be watched you know in years to come and people will have the experience of not being told what to think about the Yemeni situation but having actually experienced it and you know you so you've provided such an important historical document and that's how I feel feel about when I you know when I watch their films, it's it's amazing. You get to, you know, ride in the back of the car with Bob Dylan or, you know, that, that's what inspired me to go, you know, I saw these films and I said, we need this for our part of the world because people need to understand it, you know, understand the humanity of what people are going through in the same way, in a relatable way. And I think, 
that's one of the reasons I got so excited about about your film because even though it's so difficult, um, you know, it's such a difficult situation. Um, it 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 really uh, it was told in a way that absolutely had the dignity, the respect, um, you know, to 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 really allow you to feel like these people could be your friends. These people could be somebody that you knew um, or know. It could be your hometown, right? Yeah. Um, that's how you treated it. So I. Yeah, I, I I think I think um, I think I mean you've just touched upon one one of one of the goals in making the film right, which was to make a film that that is timely, right, but also hopefully timeless on uh, on some level, so that if you watch it in ten years, I think you'll still understand what was happening yes. in Yemen in 2020 and 2021, right? Because it's not bound by by dates, right? It's not bound by st statistics. It's it's real people's lived experiences. Um, and it's immersive and, and experiential. Yeah, exactly. And and anytime you make an experiential film, I think it it holds up a little bit differently, right? Than something that's super topical, um, even though it is topical, right? I mean, there is there's that tension as well. Yeah, we have a question. What was your biggest challenge um, in making the film? And from this is from Janat Janat um there were there were so many challenges <laughs> to, to make, to, I, I mean it, you know this every film is its own adventure and journey and challenge right um but i think um i think actually one of the most difficult challenges if not the most was um sort of finding a way not to gain access to our collaborators but to simply get in and out safely um, with cameras, because um, the, the reality is, is that the powers that be, um, being Saudi Arabia, being UAE, um, don't want this story told, don't want these kinds of stories told, because we're complicit, because our governments are complicit, because there's an air blockade, right, over most of the country because there's a sea blockade preventing food and medicine from coming in because there's financial sanctions um, causing incredible inflation, which are putting food out of affordability for most Yemenis, which is causing starvation. This is a human caused famine, right? And so that complicity, while not known while by the general, you know, American audience is real and, um, you know, and, and, and because of that, the, the less that this gets out, um, the happier they are. So we worked over eight months um, with my producer, Mike Schurman, to, to get access. Um, and it meant multiple trips to the Yemen embassy in DC. It meant multiple um, parallel applications to work both in the North and the South as a film crew, right? And they simply weren't issuing press credentials at all. And so it took it took a long time on the front end just to get access. Um, that was probably the biggest hurdle, frankly. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We have another question here, which is... Um, As a documentary filmmaker, I wonder how you deal with the anxiety that comes with, create, with creating a documentary that may offend people in power. As a journalist, investigative filmmakers, as journalists, investigative filmmakers are targeted by those that feel threatened. It can feel overwhelming and scary, no? And this is from John Kwan. This is to you as well, John. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Please. Well, please. Yeah, I don't know how you feel about that. My, my basic philosophy is that if, if you haven't pissed off some important people at some point in your life, then you're probably not doing anything worthwhile, right? Uh -huh. That's just the cost of of doing good work, I think. Um, that's part of our job is to call people to account. And so, yeah, there's the, sure, it's it's not fun always, but I think that shouldn't deter us from doing it. Um, and, you know, um, this continues in Yemen right now to this day. And I've told this story before and I'll tell it again. You know, our, our field producer um, who works so closely with us, he's in prison right now for doing his job, for telling stories like this, not because of our project, but because of a project that came later. And um, he's been in prison for over four months for simply being a journalist. And he's been tortured multiple times. 
not because he did anything illegal, because he's speaking truth to power, right? So there's there's a cost, and um, and and I applaud him and all the other great journalists in on the streets of Sana, on the streets of Aden, who continue to do this difficult, hard work um, despite those risks. How about you, Jahan? I'd love to hear your answer on that one. Well, I, I agree with you that if you're not, I remember at one point being, you know, the, when, when the square came out um, and, you know, there were members of the Muslim Brotherhood that were upset with us, member of the government that was upset, were upset with us, members of the army that were upset with us. And it was, uh, and police and, you know, and at a certain time it felt like, you know, everybody was angry with us. And I, I have to quote uh, Hassan Ibrahim, who was, you know, one of the characters in the control room said, you know, exactly what you said. It must mean you're doing something right if you're pissing everybody off, you know? So, um, so that, that, that gave me courage, but it's, it's very, it, it, it is hard. We, we do feel very fortunate right now that we're, you know, not in prison, that we are, we have been able to come back into Egypt. That wasn't always the case. We were on lists for a long time. Um, and we still have a editor of ours who is in prison. Um, she's Sanat Saif um, and her brother Alat Saif, they come from an activist family. So it's not, it's not only that she worked on the square, it's the fact that she's also from a family that they have been after. Um, but uh, it's hard, it's hard. And, and you can see by the people who are in the square. I mean, Rami Hassan, the singer is now in Europe, Ahmed Hassan, is in, in Turkey. Turkey. Uh, so, you know, Khaled's back in, Khaled's back in the UK. Um, it's a time, it's a very, it's a very difficult time to say anything right now. And, you know, yesterday on the, um, the leading like pro government talk show um, here in Egypt uh, um, during the eve of the revolution or whatever the anniversary, what the guy did mention instead of celebrating the revolution was, you know, um, was that a, uh, was that two uh, US congressmen have created a caucus on Egyptian human rights. And he was talking about it to say, oh, see, look, the Americans are gonna try to use human rights to try to topple our country again. And, you know, warning to, um, to anybody you know, watching that, you know, human rights work is basically foreign agent work trying to come in here and uh, create mayhem, which makes our jobs, your job, everyone's job, and the people who do this daily from the fixers to everybody in that ecosystem is uh, extremely difficult because you're basically called a agent of intelligence operations. Um, and that's the easiest way to basically put a huge X on everyone's back. And that increasingly becomes the way that is um, that's normalized. And obviously, the Trump administration and his war on journalism didn't really help much either with the American credibility. So we're not in a great place when it comes to the safety of um, of journalists and people doing really important work around the world. Um, so we we have to come together and we have to find ways to continue to support one another because um, our institutions are not doing the work that's needed. So uh, it takes individuals, as you said, to try and tell stories. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think, um, you know, as, as, you know, I always think, I don't think of myself as a journalist um, and maybe that's odd. I think of myself as a storyteller, but, but I, do, I do think that filmmakers, we are, we are a part of the fourth estate, right? Um, but in a really a unique way, because I think the tools we have at our behest of, of stories told cinematically have a very unique power, right? That a short news story doesn't have maybe, right? And so I think it is, it is upon us, right? To be active participating voices in the fourth estate, which you're right, Kareem, has been like, just like squeezed down and sort of, partially crushed over the last five, six, 18 years. And, and I think it's upon all of us to like assert ourselves again and say, this is our place, our rightful place. We do need to push back whenever and however we can and do that together, right? 
um, as a growing sort of um, body of voices to make sure that we have sort of our rightful place at the table to call truth to power, right? I mean, that's, that's part of what we need to continue to do. Um, listen, I, I, one of the things that I didn't mention at the top of this is that both of you were so kind um, when we set up this, we, we thought we were going to be doing it in a New York time zone for you. And I realized that <laughs> you're not in New York and you're on Cairo time right now. So I, I think it's probably in our best interest to, to wrap this up. But before we do, I just want to say thank you um, from the bottom of my heart for spending time to have this conversation. It means so much to me as a colleague, as a filmmaker and admirer of your work to um, to, to have this conversation with you, it really, it means the world. Sky, it's an honor. It's an, it's, it's an honor. You are such an incredible filmmaker and human being that it's really, um, it's really an honor to do this with you. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, anything we can do to get people to, you know, to get more attention to this film um and we're, spread we're the word. yeah spread the word and and thank you dave magdale for, for being here we love you dave for being david and we are um people can go to hungerward.org again for information about we have another screening next week uh and um uh all the information will be on the website so jahan and kareen thank you so much and we hope to meet you in person soon once it's safe yes good night everybody good night.